Randy, you've waited a long time to come back. I'm not sure what you did while you yes, were gone. Here we go. you, were here, you were here for a lot of it. Um, <laughs> but you you said you're a busy experimentalist, so you may have been out with the bees. I don't know. Is that true? I, no, I'm still working on uh, um, cranking data and change my PowerPoints, listen to Keith. Two things with, uh, some, uh, I don't know if Keith's still here or not, but one, there was one uh, paper uh, published on uh, uh, out of Europe some years ago that indicated that there was a uh, uh, pesticide resistance uh, between the two types of bees that they uh, uh, studied. Uh, I think they were rearing, rearing queens, <coughs> comparing um, those that were taken from a, a non-agricultural area to, to, to those from an agricultural area. Um, another one was uh, the question of why uh, the honeybee uh, overwinters um, in a, 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 a homeothermic uh, colony as opposed to all the other insects that allow their body temperature to drop and go to diapause. And one possibility is gives the honeybee a huge advantage for the early pollen sources, because instead of starting out as individual queens that need to forage and build a nest, you have a ready workforce of foragers ready to go when the first uh, pollen becomes available in the spring. So that gives them a, a huge uh, adaptive, uh, competitive uh, advantage over the uh, solitary bees. Excellent. So these okay. uh, PowerPoint slides are going to be fresh off the presses, huh? Yeah, some of them. Let's That's see. awesome. Um, where am I going here? There we go. OK, so let me go up to, um, OK, this I share. OK, so I'm here. Hang on, I can move around. Slideshow. And oops, um, beginning. OK, so we got enough time. If you, if you asked me to look at uh, the Varroa control during the summer and the update here, I have time also to throw in these two also, um, if you'd like to see those. I'll leave that up to you, Stephen. Want to see about the pollen sub and the probiotics? Absolutely. OK. So um, <clears throat> unlike uh, some of you beekeepers in New Mexico who uh, in the areas where you do get pollen, all during the uh, season and late in the season. In California, we don't. There's many areas here where the colony just shut down uh, starting July and there's almost no pollen coming in for the rest of the season, maybe a very slight amount in the fall. But um, when we if you put more than a handful of hives in an apiary, the competition is so great that the colonies just go downhill before winter and they will never make it to almonds. Since most of us are dependent upon uh, almond pollination for income out here, we need to get our colonies in, in better shape. <clears throat> so in 2013, I ran a comparative trial of uh, pollen subs of several different ones. And it came time, I've run other trials also on pollen subs, working with the 24 methylene cholesterol that Ramesh was talking about. And I did not find a benefit to adding the 24 methylene cholesterol to the uh, pollen sub, uh, indicating the bees are able to, uh, to uh, convert other uh, sterols to 24 methylene cholesterol themselves. And that's corroborating some USDA data. So um, I, I, I was hoping that was going to be something magic for pollen subs, but now I, I see that it's probably not. Um, so there's, there's two new pollen subs recently came on the market, the AP23 from Dadant and the healthy bee, um, the uh, spirulina algae uh, patty. So I was curious about testing these two. So <clears throat> what I did is uh, ran a trial testing out seven different uh, subs. Uh, one is the Man Lake Bulk Soft, which we have used for a number of years, mainly because uh, the bees perform well on it, but because it comes in a bulk form instead of a patty form, and we can cut it up into two and a half to four pound chunks to feed the pollinies in the center of the cluster rather than being stuck with the uh, patties, which are very hard to get into the center of the cluster. Then uh, global, uh, this is a, a, a pollen patty, their top tier, which has uh, natural pollen in it. So this is one of the two in this group that actually contain natural pollen. The rest do not contain natural pollen. AP23 was the new one from uh, Daydant, developed by an animal nutritionist uh, that they hired. Mega B is an older patty uh, developed by Dr. Gordon Wardell when he worked for USDA and now sold uh, privately. Um, Ultra, Ultra B is the Man Lake uh, flagship product, very similar to Bulk Soft, but slightly different in formulation. Um, and then a, a homebrew uh, patty. Uh, some of the funders for this research, uh, all my research is funded by Beekeeper 
donations. So, so a group of beekeepers down in the Bakersfield area um, makes their own uh, pollen sub from a, a formula rough, uh, come from a, a nutritionist from Mexico. And they liked it a lot, but they were curious how it would, would perform against the other subs on the market. So they uh, chipped in some funding to help me uh, cover this project. And then the healthy bee uh, spirulina, which is also, con oh, I'm sorry, the homebrew also contains natural pollen. So the global and the homebrew contain natural pollen. Then the spirulina patty. This is spirulina, uh, fairly new patty, still in development, but it also contains a large amount of essential oils, especially thyme oil, which um, I think what caused problems uh, as far as the bees uh, uh, wanting to consume it. And then I test these against control patties of um, an equal amount, roughly, of these all run around 50% sugar. So I made patties that had half the weight of, um, of sugar, uh, slightly over a half pound of sugar to match these. So when you run these trials, they can be confusing. There were, I, I put 144 hives in these uh, trials, so uh, 18 hives for each patty, patty type. Since there are eight patty types, that, that works out to 144. I ran it in three different yards. I'm very glad I did uh, to replicate this three times because we got slightly different results in each yard. So what we did is as we went to each yard for feeding, we would put the patties in the tubs and put uh, color-coded tape on them so we wouldn't get them confused and then marked each hive with color-coded tape so that we could feed them at each feeding and there were multiple feedings to make sure that they, uh, we didn't, didn't get the patties mixed up in the hives. And we'd lay them all out before we did any feeding and then, then once we had them all laid out, we'd go back and start feeding. We chose our, our yards, the three yards by, uh, hang on, something stuck in my tooth here. That's plugging me, there we go. Um, uh, three yards that we normally move the hives out of during the summer because we know they will go downhill without feeding. So these, we chose yards that we knew colonies would perform very poor, poorly in. <clears throat> and then what we did is we, um, we Got them kind of close to the same uh, size, all, all new queens. And then we did a uh, randomized block design. So the blocks were that we for each yard, we graded them all for strength. And then for the eight strongest colonies, we gave them randomly assigned one of each of the pollen subtypes. And then the next eight strongest, again, assigned, randomly assigned the pollen subtypes. So the pollen subs were fed equally distributed among colonies of all ranges of starting strengths. And then we fed them continually from August to October. As soon as the most attractive sub was largely consumed, we would then feed the entire yard again with new uh, patties. And if a, a colony was not consuming all their sub, we would take it out and weigh it and record how much uh, unconsumed sub there were. So we kept track of total colony consumption for all the subs also. We had trouble growing the colonies. Now we have we do grow colonies in these yards and have in previous trials and we can get them to build up on pollen sub, but we were not able to get them to build up to any extent uh, this year. And when I compared the weather, um, it was much hotter and drier than it normally is. And I compared uh, downloaded weather data, I compared it to the data from the year before and it was much hotter and drier. This is the, uh, the time when the colonies normally really put on uh, growth that late September into October uh, when we're doing the feeding. But our normal temperatures at that time of year are down in the upper 70s. This year, during that critical time, they were up pushing 90 degrees and, and very low humidity. And I, my, my explanatory hypothesis, the best I can find, the difference this year was that extreme temperature that, that prevented them from being able to expand uh, very well. And I mentioned this before about our, our warming climate. So now I looked at then at the nutrient contents of the, of the subs, at the sugar, which is the green, the uh, protein, the red, and the lipids, the oils in them, and uh, normalized them all to, to one for norm so I could compare them. And uh, this is uh, the nutrient content, how high or low it was. And this is our change in colony strength. So the higher the, uh, it's, it is up, the more the colonies uh, it, uh, gain in strength. And what you can see is the correlation with lipids, there's, there's no correlation, uh, actually a negative correlation with the amount of sugar, but a very, very strong correlation with the amount of protein in the patty. So protein is a key component of these uh, pollen sub patties. 
And then this was the protein contents of them with uh, the ultra B coming in the highest, about 22% protein, and the AP23 coming in around 14% protein. But the results are, is uh, they didn't rank this way in order, uh, final and then results. So it wasn't just the amount of protein that was in the patties. Now, here's one of the changes I just made two minutes ago, that all tested formulations appeared to exhibit a good balance of essential amino acids. So this is the Groats uh, ratio, it's black right here, uh, 1953, uh, guy named DeGroat did monumental uh, paper, 88 pages, not counting the citations, which I have lived with for the last few months, uh, going over every word over and over again. So compared to what he put down as a, a minimal amount of amino acid for uh, spread for each of these different amino, essential amino acids, that they should be not below this number right here in a diet. And you can see all of these the amino acids appeared to be better or, or, or equal or um, not deficient. What I'm seeing is I'm going to be revising <laughs> DeGroat's uh, 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 suggestions a little bit and looking at this a bit different because what I'm seeing is it looks like it, the differences were largely due to amino acid ratios. And that's what I've been working on madly for the last two weeks. And because um, I can uh, pretty much predict how they performed by the amino acid ratios. So this is gonna be some uh, really, uh, I think important information I'll soon be publishing for the benefit of um, the manufacturers who make pollen subs and for beekeepers who wanna make their own. And I have developed a little calculator that you can use to very quickly compare the ratios to any formulation that you put together. So I think we might make some uh, big uh, jumps in our pollen subs. <clears throat> Most of the, uh, I, then for analysis, I, I set these sugar controls, uh, uh, normalize them to zero for weight gain. And then what we could do then compare the gain or a population gain, not weight gain, compare the gain of the subs against the sugar controls. And all the, all the pollen subs outperform the sugar uh, controls and some outperform them by quite a, a, a bit. And we were pretty consistent. The top two subs across the yard were pretty consistent. I'm not gonna say which ones they are right now. I will be publishing all this soon when I get it all worked out. Not only that, we also, um, I was curious about whether these subs would change the gut microbiomes in the bees. So I'm collaborating with Dr. Vince uh, Rosigliano at USDA, and I have uh, took uh, frozen samples of bees from every colony uh, at the start of the trial and then uh, in November to and froze them, shipped them off, and. <laughs> 500 bucks a pop shipping them off for shipping, it's expensive. Um, and he's doing a full microbiome analysis, analysis on these and going to see if the different subs have different microbiota in the bees' guts. Um, I'm looking at this, uh, whether those essential oils had uh, adverse effects upon the bees. And then Vince also has already sent me the data where he <clears throat> dissected away out the heads and the thoraxes of, these, uh, of the bees and uh, weighed them. And the results of those uh, 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 collab, uh, well, <laughs> what am I looking for? Correlate very closely with the results of the uh, colony change in strength. So the, the weight of the, these body parts also reflect the change in strength of the colonies. So this has been very interesting and uh, I'll be uh, doing a deep dive and publishing this uh, soon. I was going to run that trial simultaneously with one on the probiotics, but then I um, decided to split them into two separate trials. <clears throat> so there's these great sales pitches on feeding these direct microbials or DFMs to the honeybees. And I know the manufacturers, and when I talk to them at the trade shows, I, they, when I walk up with a smile, they just smile back and just say, uh, not yet because they know the question I'm going to ask them. And that question is, uh, have you got supportive data yet for your claims that you can show me that I, <laughs> I, can, I can write about? And uh, not yet means, no, they don't have supportive data yet. So first come the sales pitches and the videos and stuff, and then second comes any supportive data or evidence to back up those claims. So I wanted to try the two main ones on the market, the uh, Super DFM from Strong Microbials and Pro DFM from Man Lake. They're both, you know, they're fairly expensive uh, to feed to your colonies. 
I fed them once a month, July to October. We ran the trial uh, in two separate yards. Uh, one yard was the sunny yard, and one yard was a shady yard at higher elevation. So a warmer yard and a cooler yard. And we graded all the hives uh, for starting and any strengths, uh, looking top to bottom on the frames um, to uh, get our counts. And this is my one of my newest technicians here. This is uh, Ryder, who is, this is my son, Eric. This is Ryder's his son, so Ryder is my grandson. And Ryder is one sharp little kid, and he is a great technician as far as making sure that we uh, check, get every hive, feed it correctly, and record all the data. So uh, up and coming technician here. And here's a picture with Ryder. I uh, welded together a special portable uh, uh, weighing device, a, a hand truck with a cradle that we just slide in underneath the hive, pull the handle down, and use a like, very expensive digital scale to get our weights down to the tenth of a of a pound here. Then we uh, once a month uh, sprinkle the uh, tablespoon of the probiotic over the top of the hives. So 26 hives in each test group. And then at the end of the trial, so here's the results for one yard for the shady yard. And the starting strengths of the hives are in blue. And I've ranked them in order of starting strength here. And the ending strengths are in red. So if you look at the difference between the starting and the ending strength, like I said, a lot of them went downhill in, in strength. If you see a benefit to the probiotics, you're going to see a difference between the, the three different test groups. One of these is the, 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 the one probiotic, another one's a separate probiotic, and the third one's the control group. I am blinded still to treatment. I don't know which one was which, so I can't tell you. But I can tell you, when I run statistics, I didn't see any uh, benefit to feeding uh, uh, the probiotic over either of the probiotics over the control group as far as uh, gain in colony strength. And then what I looked at is weight gain also. Now they did gain weight. So starting weight was blue and ending weight was red. And as you can see, there was no difference between the three different treatments on the weight gain. So right now, at least my data does not support uh, either of the claims that they were beneficial for colony uh, strength or beneficial for weight uh, gain. Then we want to do also another deep dive into the gut microbiota. These are probiotics, so we would expect them possibly to affect the gut microbiome. So um, I'm working collaborating with Dr. Kirk Anderson. I just sent off a check for uh, $5,000 to help with the analysis again, and I've sent him a number of samples again. And it's just amazing how much all this stuff costs, but we're gonna get some neat stuff out of this. So he's going to look at how the um, bacterial strains in the guts, whether any of them in the probiotics actually got into the, uh, into the guts of the bees, um, whether the uh, feeding either probiotic affected the community structure of the, of the bees' guts, um, um, and whether it's uh, affected the pathogens in the bees. Then we had another question. Well, some beekeepers are buying these probiotics under the belief that it will help the bees to reestablish their gut microbiome after they apply an antibiotic to the hive. So we, after we got the strength and weight data, we started a separate trial and uh, 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 treated uh, the hives with divided into three groups uh, um, of each of the treatment groups, divided them into three again to receive treatment of either uh, tylosin or teramycin or just powder sugar control. And we gave them three treatments four days apart of the antibiotics to wipe out the, the, the uh, microbiome in the bees' guts. And then let me see if I got it here. And then, uh, and, and then took samples of bees, froze them, and shipped them off on dry ice at that time. And then um, a week after the last treatment, fed uh, a probiotic again to each colony. And then a week after that, uh, took samples of the bees again, uh, and then uh, two weeks later, so we at, at one week and two weeks after feeding the probiotic, took samples to see whether it helped with the reestablishment of the gut microbiome in either the short or the long term. So all those samples are now at the lab, getting ready to be processed, and we'll be able to get do a, again a deep dive into the gut microbiomes. Okay. 
let's look at varroa control during the uh, uh, summer. I'm going to sk skip to we are saw some of these slides here. Okay, so back to this one. Uh, hypothermia, our uh, treatment at using high temperature to kill the mites. And there have been some studies out of Europe that uh, um, this one here claimed that um, if you hold it up to uh, 40 to 47 degrees, that's 104 degrees uh, Fahrenheit for 2.5 hours, mortality of the mites in the sealed boot is virtually absolute. Well, that's a pretty strong statement for a scientific paper to say virtually absolute. Virtually absolute means close to 100%. So I was curious about this. So we started doing some research on this. Uh, first, I ran a test. I'm going to show you the results of the test. And because of the results of the test, I, I did a deeper dive into this. And what I have here is, if you look at the, uh, on the left is the, uh, these are the temperature tolerances of Varroa or honeybees in Fahrenheit in this column and centigrade in this column. And this is the effect on Varroa, and this is the effect upon the bees over, over here. And what you can see is Varroa, um, optimal Varroa reproduction is fairly cool, cooler than, actual, than brood nest temperature. This is brood nest temperature, that what the bees keep their worker brood at right here. Uh, drone brood slightly cooler. Um, but for optimal Varroa reproduction, it's just at the low end of brood nest temperature. Varroa is still adapted for Apis serrana, its original host, not for Apis mellifera. Um, and then once you start getting up like 100, 102 degrees, Varroa can no longer reproduce. And they start getting seriously stressed at about this 106 to 108 range. Up to 110, they start dying very, very quickly. <clears throat> Whereas uh, worker bees, they can handle temperatures clear up to here up to that 104 uh, pretty easily. Um, they can handle short-term treatments clear up to like the 112. You have to be up to getting around 115 degrees before the adult bees um, start dying. And the bees can handle a short-term temperature treatment better than the mites can handle this. So this is just to give you an idea comparing the thermal tolerances of these two species. Then some beekeepers sent me some data saying they had great luck with these thermal treatments. This is Mike Immer and he has mite wash counts here showing this incredible work right here. So based upon that, I thought I'd do a trial myself. And I used a thermal device that uh, inserted to the front of the hive. And I'm not gonna say the name of the device. And I sealed the hive up carefully and put an insulation board on the top. And sure enough, the bees do beard out in, in the front. I also added two other thermistors of my own to the tops of the hives so that I could actually validate that the inside of the hive did reach the temperature that was claimed and did it for the uh, period of time that was uh, claimed. So I, I, I confirmed that it was two and, a half, two and a half hours they were held at this 106 degree temperature, not only in the airspace between the frames, but I, one of the thermistors was uh, inserted down to the midrib of the comb underneath the seal of brood and yes, the temperature uh, did go clear up to 106 degrees and um, uh, uh, was held uh, for the two and a half hours there. <clears throat> then what I did to confirm that almost near absolute mortality of the mites is to at 24 hours and with some hives at 40, 48 hours, um, uh, dissected out some brood and counted the live mites, number of live mites compared to the number of dead mites in the brood. And here's a patch of a uh, drone brood I dissected out, and as I pulled the uh, pupae or, or uh, pro pupae out and put them in the tray, if this were a movie right now, you would see all these mites actively walking around in apparently very good health right here. I was surprised at the low percentage of mite kill from the treatment. The, the first dissection I did from the first hive was the only one where there were more dead mice than live mice. And this is one little strip of drone brood right along, single line of drone cells along the bottom bar. So they must've gotten extra good exposure to the heat. Um, so there was two live to 16 dead. Every other instance in both the drone brood and the worker brood, there were far more live mice compared to dead mice. 34 live, three dead, 40 live to eight dead. In the worker brood, 22 live, to two dead, I couldn't find any uh, there. And, uh, and I did look at a 48 hour treatment also to see if those mites took longer to die. So I was 
surprisingly high mite survival after treatment. And then contrary to Mike Immer's findings, when I tracked alcohol wash counts of these, they did go down for 15 days, but if the mites had been sterilized, as was one of the uh, claims, they would not, the mite um, population hive would not be expected to rise rapidly. But what I found was, yes, it does rise uh, rapidly after that. So I was disappointed. And that's why I'm saying, if any of you guys have data, I'm writing up an article right now on, on this. I've sent off the first installment, but I'm looking at other people's data. If you have some good data on uh, mite washes or mite drops. The other thing I did, I found a very uh, interesting paper, a, 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 a PhD dis dissertation out of Chile. And they introduced me to the concept of uh, thermal death, death curves that you use when you are sterilizing or disin disinfesting things such as grain or vegetables or fruits by using heat to kill pests. So I took the data available uh, from the literature. Uh, these are the, uh, this is the duration of exposure, how many hours, up to 25 hours. This is your temperature of exposure. And I plotted out uh, lab determined data for mites, these red uh, circles, and then fitted the curve to that for the thermal death curve for Varroa. So Varroa mites at a relatively low temperature, 41 degrees C, they, um, it takes about 24 hours to kill most of the mites. But if you take them clear up to 47 degrees, they're all dead within an hour. So this is your thermal death curve. Then <clears throat> there's very little data for honeybees. So I was only able to find three data points um, at one particular humidity. So we need a lot more data points here, but this gave us an idea of, of what we need to find out. And I hope some researchers will follow up on this and get more data points at different humidities. We really need to draw a three-dimensional graph because humidity is also an issue. And what we're looking for for the sweet spot is something a, a point that is above this curve that will kill mites and below this curve that will hurt the bees. So you can see here's the sweet spot right here, right between these two curves. And what I'm seeing is the device that I used was uh, not quite warm enough to hit this sweet spot for the amount of time involved. Okay, uh, let's move on to other treatments. The problem is during the summer, many beekeepers have honey supers on. And there's only two treatments approved for use while the honey supers are on. And those are HopGuard, now the new HopGuard 3 out, which they've changed the formulation slightly. It now is less irritating to the bees. Um, and it's, uh, they, uh, the corrugated strip is supposed to release the uh, active ingredient for over 14 days, which extends it out for better efficacy. The Formic Pro is the uh, next generation after Midaway quick chips and has sawdust uh, mixed in there. And what it does is it uh, makes it a more stable product. It doesn't melt down and get all uh, as gloopy. Much easier, at least when it's fresh, uh, for the applicator. I'm much happier putting this on. You don't get that blast of formic acid when you open up the package. Okay, so I was curious then about the um, um, the uh, comparison between my quick strips and the Formic Pro. So I put this, um, them into a uh, 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 double deep hive with all dark drawn combs, but no bees. So no bees didn't, um, couldn't have any effect. And I staggered uh, strips of the Max, the old my quick strips, the red, and the Formic Pro, the blue, and then weighed how much uh, weight loss, and the weight loss is from the Formic Acid each day. And that told you how much was released each day. The optimal range in a hive for formic acid loss when there's bees is somewhere in this range or slightly above that. So you can see you got about three days. The first thing you notice, it was the same release rate for both the formic pro and the quick strips, which very much surprised me because you don't smell it as much on the formic pro. The second thing was that it's a fairly short-term treatment right here. It really, you're dropping down to below this optimal range uh, pretty quickly. There's also um, limits for each one. Hopguard says that its efficacy increases when there's less brood. Well, that's the, the flip side of saying the efficacy decreases when there's more brood. And this was a summertime treatment, so there was brood in the colonies. 
The Formic Pro says it has a recommended temperature to not apply it over 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, I wish in California in our summers, we could wish for cooler temperature like that, but that's not a, a possibility. So I did apply it at a higher temperature intentionally. Then I, the other one thing I tried was my extended lease uh, oxalic acid and glycerin, which I, I'm working with the USDA to try to get registered uh, 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 by EPA for, uh, for all beekeepers. And I used the Swedish sponge cloths this year rather than the shop towels. Uh, they could hold a lot more, and they also don't get chewed up or propolized to any extent. The bees put a little bit of propolis around the edge is all. Each one of these I held 25 grams of glycerin and 25 grams of oxalic acid. And we uh, made a, a thousand sponges uh, worth to, to test out. And again, I do have the pesticide research authorization. This is not an approved treatment. We ran the trial on 263 hives in seven different yards. I ran it, we applied the treatments and I uh, uh, did mite washes afterwards at uh, two brood cycles after the mite wash so we can see uh, how it affects the varroa in the brood. The temperatures were high and I intentionally used second year queens in all the colonies. Now we had a really lousy spring last year. so. Um, we did not have big, strong honey producing colonies at the time. So many of the colonies, most were around eight to 10 frames in strength in a single Langstroth. So we added a second uh, deep, uh, either drawn comb or a foundation on top of them to let them work up. So I'm not sure that these results would give you the same efficacy as in a strong colony with honey supers on it, but we the comparative efficacies is really what I'm interested in. And we intentionally started with colonies um, uh, with second year queens that had high mite counts. You get, I get much better data for efficacy experiments if you have a high enough starting mite count that you can see an appreciable reduction or not. So here was the treatments that were tested. The oxyoxygen glycerin, a single sponge or two sponges or put in on shop towels. Hop guard, one strip for five frames of bees. Formic Pro, two different application methods. One strip at a time, repeated at 10 days, and then, or two strips at one time. And then we had a group of uh, control hives, but weren't perfect controls because they didn't exactly match everybody else because we didn't want to start with any super high mite colonies that would um, uh, uh, flood the rest of the yards with mites or die before the trial was over. So these were all lower mite colonies right here. And that does make a big difference on this because we found out all these treatments, you get much better um, results starting with a high mite hive or more noticeable results starting with a high mite hive than you do with a low mite hive. So here's the shop towels going in. And here's a um, Formic Pro strip. And just for size comparison, this is what the uh, sponge looks like, roughly the same size. And this is a hop guard strip right here. And we found that these uh, kitchen tongs are really handy for applying these uh, acid strips right here. And then these uh, disposable um, plastic uh, restaurant gloves, really handy for putting in the hop guard three. This is a typical test yard here. Uh, blackberry just coming to an end of bloom. It hasn't rained by this time for a, a month and a half or so, and it's not going to rain again uh, throughout the, uh, the trial. And then we did get a uh, surprise. Uh, we didn't think we could get a honey flow but uh, due to the drought, but we did. And some of the colonies uh, uh, pretty well filled out the uh, second box with, with honey. So we recorded the starting mite count, the yard uh, name, uh, the treatment, um, whether they uh, were queenless or queen right at the end of the trial, the ending mite count, and whether or not they had worked up into the upper box or, or not. 263 hives total. This is the data from 22. So I had 263 lines of this stuff to crank. Okay, so the treatment results here, hang on one second, make sure it's not an emergency here. Nope. 
Um, these results at 42 days. <clears throat> I'm going to show the results in this manner here. I'm going to put the yard abbreviation across the bottom so you can look for a yard effect. So this would be a different yard, this would be a different yard here. I'm going to show the starting mite count in blue. This is mites per half cup of bees and the ending mite count in red. So that means when you look at one of these graphs here, if you see a lot of red, the mite counts went up. If instead you see a lot of blue, that means the mite counts went down. And then at the end here, I calculated the group, the group median value. That means half above, half below, and will tell you across all the yards how well that treatment performed. <clears throat> so here's our control group. As you see, can see here, you see a lot of red, and that was expected. The mite counts did go up in most of the hives, some fairly substantially. Overall, they went up about one and a half times the starting uh, count right here. So that was good. That validated that I could use that as a baseline to compare the treatment efficacy of the uh, treatments against. This is for the uh, single Formic Pro strip applied uh, twice, uh, once 10 days later. And what you see here is um, lots of blue. Pretty good. We got a reduction down to only 17% of the starting count, except for a few outliers where the mite counts stayed the same or actually went up. These three were all in the same yard, and I have no idea why that occurred. Okay, this is the uh, two formic strips. Again, apply it once. Very lots of blue looking really good. Two outliers, but this time they were in two separate yards. Again, I have no idea why that is, and reduced it down to about 20% of the starting count. So roughly the same median reduction. Although this would give you the, the, the take home is if you want a quick mite knockdown, formic acid gives you the quickest of any mite knockdowns. So that, that's what we use in our operation if we want a quick mite knockdown of a high mite hive. Now the formic very clearly killed the, killed the mites very quickly, they dropped right down. You can see them on top of the, the pad here. Um, and again, formic acid leaves a beautiful brood pattern afterwards. And to our surprise, despite putting this formic acid on in the hot weather and it being very disruptive to the bees, if you look at the date here, this is run in 2020. These were frames of foundation, so a, a deeper foundation put on top of a single. And yet, despite the formic treatment, the bees drew all the frames of foundation and filled a fair amount of honey in, into there. So uh, they could handle the formic and still make some honey. The question, of course, what we worry about is what Mel Melanie was asking about this morning, where they second their queens. I intentionally ran all these colonies with started them with second year queens. They had already worked for a year, had gone to uh, almond pollination. We brought them back, we split them into nukes and let them build back up with the second year queen. At the time of the trial, these queens were getting aged. They were starting to run out of stored sperm and they were starting to get superseded by their workers. So this, is, uh, this would be the group of queens to be most concerned about being affected by formic acid. And if we look at the recommended temperature, this temperature range right here, the high temperature, here is our actual temperature plot for uh, with a red line for the maximum recommended temperature. And you can see our daylight highs were well above for both the first treatment and for the second treatment. So they, we, this was really the acid test for formic acid. And the bees responded accordingly. Now, if I were going to do this as a beekeeper um, on your own, I would not apply formic acid strips in the middle of a hot day. I would wait until dusk to apply them and maybe also offset the box to allow a little more ventilation in, in there. <clears throat> well, we didn't do that. We really just gave it to them as worse as it could be. They had a three quarter inch B way across the front and solid bottoms, no other ventilation. Big question now, what did that do to the queens? Well, first, let me just say, people talk about formic acid killing queens, but that's merely a supposition. When I have caged queens and workers together in pushing cages below formic acid strips, I don't see that the queens die at any higher rate than the workers do. 
So I'm not sure whether it's the formula that kills the queens or the bees that kill the queens. So here's the results of what I did. What I look for is uh, after 42 days, I went through the colonies and uh, if they were, it, they either had a laying queen or they didn't, or they were dead. So if they did not have a laying queen or they were dead, I counted them as queenless. Now, many of them had superseded their queens, likely uh, a lot of them from the acid, but uh, uh, for the control group, they didn't get any treatment at all. We had about a 5% uh, of queenless at the end of the trial out of the 39 uh, control hives. They got no treatment at all, <clears throat> fairly low mite hives. For the formic pro strips, 28 of those, we only had 4% that did not have a queen. Many of them had new queens, but on day 42, they had a laying queen. The two strips applied at the same time. I, I broke it apart through six yards. In six of the yards, we had 11% that were queenless. But one of the yards where we had applied the strips right in the middle of the day in the most extreme heat, there were like only five uh, uh, hives in that yard and uh, for the formic uh, two strip treatment. And all five of those uh, went uh, were queenless at the end of the trial. I guess that was just too intense for them. Then for the hop guard and the formic acid, roughly that same low rate of uh, expected rate of queenlessness. So this is surprising that the formic pro strips applied under the absolute worst heat conditions with no extra ventilation. We did not have a higher rate of queenlessness at the end of the trial than we did for just the untreated control hives. For the hop guard, there was an issue with interpreting the label. And I was not the only scientist last summer who misinterpreted the label. And I've been working with the manufacturer for the last few weeks in rewriting the uh, label to clarify it for the benefit of the beekeepers. And they're gonna uh, put a, revise the label on the, um, on the product. I just got the last draft yesterday uh, looking through here. Um, and I'll just tell you right now, the results were not, uh, they would be embarrassing to show a single application when there's brood in the colony in July uh, is not enough. Um, so next year I will try doing repeated applications and see how that works. But the hop guard works very, <coughs> very good data for it when a colony is queen is a broodless. But if you if it has if it has brood, it's going to take more than one application. The shop towels, uh, not too impressive. Of course, the problem was when you started. These are also with. Uh, 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 low mite ones just because it was an afterthought. Um, and with the low mite colonies, you don't tend to see this, this huge reductions you do with, with the high mite colonies. So 38% of the uh, starting count. <clears throat> the 125 gram uh, sponge, lots of blue here. Now you look right here and uh, Stephen maybe can help me uh, with the interpretation of this one here. You see this, that the starting mite count was um, on this one was like a 66, mites or so and i don't know if your mic's on or not can you tell me what the uh, ending count was right there sure looks like zero that would be a zero if you don't see red that means ending count was a zero so you can see some of these um with the single sponge the had monster reductions maybe even cleared down to zero from excessively high mite counts now when we go to the two sponge treatment you can see we have a lot more zero look at these these this started at over 70 mites on the first mite wash down to zero down here, starting at 50 mites in an alcohol wash cup. And so these colonies you would typically have written off, they'd be dead. These are just the worst case ready, would soon be collapsing. And yet this treatment took them down to zeros or close to zeros. So uh, down to 10%. When I calculate the uh, efficacies here, I calculated them by two method, different methods. One was just based on the sum of mite counts. So this is your, I added up all of the starting counts for the start for this treatment group and all the, the mite counts for the end and uh, compared those. The other way I just based upon the median values of the starting or the ending mite counts. And they came, they ranked in the same uh, order here <coughs> with the best treatment of any of them that I tried was the oxalic acid the two sponges right here. So very promising as per uh, uh, efficacious treatment. 
One of the questions I wondered about, because I was putting 50 grams, which is a large amount of oxalic acid, uh, on the two sponges, 50 grams in total, into the hive, whether that amount of oxalic acid would have a deleterious effect. And I'm going to ask you again, Stephen, to help me out with a, uh, an evaluation here. This is at the end of the trial, 42 days. I pulled two combs of brood out of a typical colony treated with the 50 grams of oxalic acid. In your judgment as a beekeeper, do you notice any adverse effect on the brood? I do not. If you reverse... <laughs> <laughs> no, for, for late August uh, brood patterns, these looked exceptionally good, actually. So by eliminating the bro from the hive, you wind up getting these very nice brood patterns. So I haven't seen, even though I would expect to see adverse effects with this ratio, the one-to-one -one ratio, I don't, I don't see that. We'll return to this in, in a minute. Now, I also ran a bunch of other experiments, too. We were working with a couple of grad students at um, these high elevation uh, uh, yards at 6,500 feet. So this may be of interest to you guys at that higher elevations around these uh, wet meadows up there. <clears throat> and the grad students had been uh, counting the pollinators that were on the flowers prior to us getting there. And they uh, could assure us there were zero resident honeybees in the area. No honeybees at all until we brought our hives in there. But that's what they were studying. They were stud studying the impact of honeybees in here. This was also a very different situation. This is later in the season and these bees did make a very nice honey crop up there and they grew in strength and they started drone rearing like crazy. So the other trial, there were no drone, no, there was no drone brood in those colonies for mites to reproduce in at a high rate. Up here, these colonies just packed in the drone brood. So by all measure, the, the drone, because of that drone brood, we should have had a huge increase in mite population. The other variable at these high elevation yards, there were no other hives. That means there's no drift of mites and bees from any other hives. And this looks like this turned out to be a very important factor. So this is for uh, one of the yards right here. Then what we did is we put one sponge on the low mite hives and two sponges on the high mite hives. We came back after 63 days and did our alcohol, our, uh, alcohol wash counts. And as you can see, again, lots of zeros and bring that mite count down across the board. The other two yards are even more impressive. And uh, when, when my sons brought back uh, these yards uh, here, um, they, they unloaded them at the home yard. And the next day I said, okay, Eric, I'm just dying to see. This is 77 days up with tons of drone brood on a honey flow. And I, I thought, oh my God, are these guys are gonna just be crawling with mites or what? And we're doing all these mite washes. And after we did some, I, Eric was running the uh, agitator and I was taking the, the bee samples. I said, Eric, how are we looking? He said, dad, in all our years of mite washing, I've never seen so many zeros in a row. Look at these starting counts, 50 mites in the alcohol wash, 40 mites in the alcohol wash, and 77 days later, we're down to zeros across the board. So very, very impressive. And my, the take home from this is it appears that it's because of the lack of immigration of mites from other hives that allowed this, this, form, this oxalic acid to have this long-term effect. Um, uh, I, can't, I can't remember where I put that. We also had an other isolated yard up in a desert valley in, in Nevada with no other hives around. And the same thing, it was 77 days and the hives came back just zeroed out on mites and, and with a big honey crop. So the oxalic acid clearly did not suppress the, the bee's ability to put on a big honey crop. And at the same time, it was taking the mites down to zero. Now, you already saw I was running these other trials. So in my other trials, in the rest of our yards, we were also uh, uh, using oxalic acid uh, and glycerin. And we started these, those highs from nukes. Um, in the nuke, we just took a quarter strip with 12 and a half grams of oxalic and hung it over the top bar. Or if they were already in a double, we used uh, just a, a quarter strip cut this way. So a very low amount of oxalic acid going in. <clears throat> and then when we checked that, we put them in in June, so June counts, then 
follow-up count, this is a, uh, a late July count, and took them right down, even with that slow, low application rate, because we applied it to them when the colonies were small in June. Um, this is, again, late July. This is uh, September 4th. What we saw was by September 4th, after putting them in June, the mite counts would start to climb up again a little bit. So it's a, a very, uh, uh, it looks like it's gonna be an excellent treatment to put on in early June, and that'll hold you until September. So it's a long-term treatment, and it works best where there's little mite immigration. So then I was curious, after we took that data, what, it, well, what would happen if I just didn't do any of those hives and waited past 42 days. So I waited until day 72 here. <clears throat> and you can see not so much with the single sponge treatments, but with the double sponge treatments, those that still have remaining high mite counts continued to go down. So it is a, a, a very persistent treatment in the hives. So here's a couple of observations of interest. This is some data from uh, 2018 when I was testing out a bunch of different ratios of glycerin to oxalic acid, a two to one ratio, um, uh, it's either saturated or put on half saturated onto the, uh, uh, the towels. I called that dry. Um, and here's our baseline mite drop. So these are sticky board counts taken every uh, few days. And so this is the baseline sticky board count. And was, what you can see is the mite drop for some of these, especially these, um, the, uh, the high glycerin ones right here, just jumped up immediately. So by day two, we were, get, we were up to 15 times the rate of mite drop. Some of the other ones, the one-to-one -one ratio, we did not get that um, um, uh, increase unless it was um, a saturated towel, which is what we used on the, uh, on the sponges this year. And that did get a very good uh, mite drop there. But here's the interesting thing. It kept that high mite drop above the baseline for a clear month before they started to drop back down again. So um, it maintains its elevated mite drop. Now here's the interesting thing. And Stephen, I'm gonna ask you one more, put your neck out here. Based upon this, where you can see that on the sticky board counts, these treatments all increased our daily mite fall up to, that's five times baseline, this, so averaging maybe two and a half times baseline day after day for a month. If I were taking alcohol washes of those adult bees, what would you expect to see be happening with this elevated mite drop? What would you see in the alcohol washes? Well, I guess <laughs> I would hope it would be close to zero, but I guess I don't you know. You think that they'd be going down, wouldn't you, as the, we have this increased mite drop? You would, yes. You certainly would. I would have too. <laughs> but that's not what happened. <laughs> here's our baseline alcohol wash starting count right here. And here's what we got for, uh, um, see this, we're going to it double, this is doubling the alcohol wash count for two weeks. And it was finally, it was almost a month before the alcohol wash counts ever started going below the baseline count. Totally opposite of what we would think. So this is a, a very interesting. Let me see if I got anything. Okay, no, I don't have it there. The only explanatory hypothesis that I can think of here is that it, the oxalic acid and glycerin affected the mites olfactory sense and prevented them from properly identifying uh, cells of, of uh, larvae of the right age to open and then reproduce in those cells. And they were staying out on the adult bees, which maintained the higher alcohol wash counts. That's my hypothesis, explanatory hypothesis. Uh, perhaps this summer we'll be able to do an experiment and uh, try to confirm that or, or not. We'll see what we can do. But very interesting observation, very exactly contrary to what we would expect. And that's often the most exciting science is when you get a result that's just opposite of what you expected to get. That's when you start making discoveries. If, it, if it's the same result as you expect, it's not a discovery. This is a discovery. Okay, question is how much of the dose was released? Oh, you know, I don't think I put this, you know, I took some slides out of here. There, 
The other observation of interest, if I go back to these uh, here, this two to one ratio, this is the ratio that the Argentines use, two parts glycerin by volume to one part acid by weight, that will cause agitation of the bees and possibly some uh, brood kill. So um, it also makes a towel that's very awkward to handle, very sloppy. So we like this one-to-one -one ratio where the, it's a super saturated solution. So once it cools on the sponge or the towel, it uh, hardens up and crystallizes. So they're much easier to handle. You don't get all that floppy uh, solution all over your hands and, and tools. So the second thing was at the end of the treatment, these uh, sponges, which had 25 grams of oxalic acid in them, still, it was obvious, they still had plenty of acid in them. So I, when I weighed them and then did the calculations, I found out they'd only released a fraction of their oxalic acid. So, so even though you have 25 grams on there, they may only be releasing five grams or so of oxalic acid to the bees on the hive. So it doesn't take a whole lot of oxalic acid in the hive to affect good mite control. So the conclu conclusion I made from this is that the reason that the two sponges work better than the one sponge was not because of the dose of oxalic acid, but simply because of the surface area. We needed more surface area of sponge on there. So we still have some questions to answer. One of them was, was the preliminary trials of this uh, by Jennifer Berry at University of Georgia did not get as good results as I got out in California. So I had a high school uh, volunteer in uh, Virginia went in a project and he, I said, I, I can work with you if you get a, a, a permit from your state to uh, do an experiment, get an experimental use permit. And he did. And so he tried it um, in Virginia on a number of hives, high humidity, 75% humidity. And um, he found over the, uh, uh, the treatment, the 42 day treatment, they got 88% efficacy um, across the board. And with the, um, with the two strip treatment, even better. Unfortunately, he only used the two strip treatment on one hive, but even with all the other ones, they got good efficacy. The second thing just was just published out of uh, Veracruz, Mexico. And I had the, the, the good fortune of being invited to speak down there a few years ago. And I took this photograph of the, the, how they keep the bees with the ant guards and all the, uh, uh, the posts that they put their beehives on. And um, this is very high humidity, tropical area, and they got 88% efficacy in that high humidity. So the issue in Georgia, I, my, I suspect, was a mite drift issue rather than a, a, a poor efficacy issue. So this apparently will work also in high humidity. So now the question is, the shop towels were not ideal. Um, the sponges, I don't feel are ideal. So I'm trying a bunch of different matrices. I have 12 different matrices on hands right, right now that I plan to be testing uh, starting uh, early this summer. <clears throat> the other thing I wanna do is start tracking the distribution of oxalic acid within the hive. And I've developed this technique here where I can use a, um, an indicator solution and do titrations. And I can put five milliliters of water into a test tube and then uh, use, use a uh, adjusting uh, 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 sodium hydroxide to, uh, um, to bring it up to this color. So I match this color right here, the pH of six. Then when I drop a B in there, any oxalic acid will push that color towards this orange color right here. <clears throat> so if it has a lot of oxalic acid on it, it will turn the solution orange. This one turned it to this greenish color here down to a pH of four. And now I can add titrant back one drop at a time to try to turn this color back to blue. And when I reach the matching blue again, by the number of drops tell me how many micrograms, that's millionth of a gram of oxalic acid is on the bee's body. So this is what I've been, I've been trying to get, get on to finding time to do this for a year now. I'm hoping this spring I can get out there. And um, my preliminary results are really interesting. You can walk out to a hive, it takes about 15 seconds to do this. And I can see that after an oxalic acid dribble, the oxalic acid is very well distributed uh, on the bees in the hive within an hour at, a, um, at the proper uh, rate. With the couple that I looked at with vaporization, I did not find oxalic acid. So I'm very much interested in following up and seeing 
on which treatment application method gives the best distribution of oxalic acid onto the bees in the hive. <clears throat> so this treatment is, of all the acid treatments, formic and oxa or oxalic, this is by far the safest application method that I found, the most user-friendly application method. We always carry a gallon jug of baking soda dissolved in water at the rate of 10 heaping tablespoons per gallon. We got a lot of baking soda in, and I tested this out um, empirically. Um, this solution will, if you just pour it onto your hands or your hive tool or your smoker, will immediately neutralize any formic or oxalic acid. We also figured out how to uh, make these strips in, uh, by bulk. Uh, if, uh, if you put 80 of these quarter strips in there and just mix a thousand grams of oxalic acid with a thousand grams of glycerin, get it hot, pour it over here, let them sit. You have, you have these 80 sponge strips already prepared. No other um, manipulation necessary. Very quick and easy to produce them. So again, this is not approved. I'm not suggesting anybody use this method. But if we can get it approved, this is going to be a game changer for varroa management. And I want to thank the beekeepers who have donated to this research. All my research is funded strictly by donations from beekeepers themselves. So I, if any of you are on this list, I thank you for that. And I am ready to take questions. Randy, well, thank you. You know, that was, um, that was masterful. I don't know how you fit it all in. We talked about protein patties. We talked about probiotics. We talked about thermal treatment. We talked <laughs> about different tr summer treatments. So thank you. And thank you for being the bookends of what we think is a, was a very successful conference. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I take the advantage of being the host and that I have this, um, I get to ask my questions first. We do, we do have a number of questions. So I have this uh, somewhat perverse interest in the thermal treatment. Yeah. I did purchase one of these units and, um, and so I'm just curious. I know you only tested one hive. No, four hives. Yeah, I'm sorry. Four hives. Okay, but you showed a, a decrease at day 15. Yeah. What I've heard from the, because I've heard you talk about the lack of dead mites after 48 hours. And in, I didn't really have a conversation with the developers of the unit, but they said it will take several more days than, than just the first two days. So I did note that you had you know, a significant decrease at 15 days. But then it went back up, and I'm just wondering, you know, you you, you do do deal with hives with lots and lots of mites, and, and so I'm just wondering, could that increase have been to from drift from from other hives in the area? Um, um, not not at that time. We didn't. We were not running any. Um, those four hives were moved into that yard with high mites intentionally, and we didn't have other high mite hives around at that time. Okay. All right. Great. And so. One question about oxalic acid. Many of us here uh, do use oxalic acid, but as a drip, uh, yes. using the drip method. So can you talk about why um, you're promoting, do you think the sponges would take, they're an improvement over the dribble? First, I'm not promoting anything. <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's salesmanship. I'm not selling anything at all. I just supply the data. So um, with the drip um, method, um, it's not registered, but like I said before, some beekeepers that I know have sw switched over to using glycerin as opposed to sugar, and there are uh, advantages to, to doing that. So if you are using the drip, that's something also to think about. Um, again, not yet approved. Um, as far as the uh, extended release, yeah, uh, the drip method doesn't work very well when there's brood in the colony because it has, it's a short-term treatment. The extended treatment, um, works very well uh, because as the mites emerge, they are exposed to it. Um, uh, we've already run tests. I've already taken honey samples and had them analyzed. It does not increase the oxalic acid appreciably in the honey. So there's no concern about that. Um, and the beauty is uh, when you put your honey supers on early in the season, you could just throw the sponges on. And when you take your honey supers off, your mite control is already, already done. So it's um, it, it could very well fit into a, um, a integrated pest management system. Now, of course, beekeepers being who beekeepers are, the first question I always get is, can I just leave them in all year round, Randy? <laughs> and it, that is the number one question I get. 
it would not be necessary to do that. And I would strongly recommend not doing that. We really don't know if there are any long-term adverse effects. And the second thing is to avoid resistance developing. It would be a really good idea to rotate it with thymol or rotate it with formic acid to avoid resistance. Well, thanks for that answer. I, yeah, I forgot to I forgot myself that we, we typically use the dribble in the late fall when there's not much brood in the hive. Right. Now, there was, there was one study. It hasn't been published yet out of Canada because I'm curious how it would work over the winter. Um, and that said, it did work. And we did a small, we don't have any formal data right now. But um, what we're looking at, what we're seeing in our own operation, and we'll know better when we bring our hives back from almonds, is um, how they did over the winter with it. But that looks very promising also. That's great. Well, so if you don't mind, we have a question that backs you up to the conversation about the uh, uh, protein subs. How do you administer the patties to the hives? Do you lay the entire patty in between two boxes? Yes, right in the, as close to the center of the brood nest as possible. When you put it in in patty form instead of chunk form, any that extends out beyond the cluster, the bees will not touch. And if high small high beetle is there, they will touch it. But um, to get best use of a patty, it should be fed right in the middle of the cluster. That's why we like the, the soft form of patties that we just chunk up in the field with a spade. All right, great. So uh, there's a lot of interest, you know, you, you present a lot of data and I think a lot of it was absorbed, but several folks have expressed interest in wanting to revisit that data. So can they just get that from your website? Um, we're just, I, I am constrained on how quickly I can publish stuff after um, it's, uh, uh, it gets published in ABJ. So I just uh, put my, uh, on my flash drive right here, I just put the four articles on the summer mite treatments on here. And my assistant will be uploading these uh, starting this weekend and they should be up soon. And now if you're on my mailing list for my website, I'll send out a notification when these are all, are all up. And then I haven't published the um, pollen sub data yet. Um, and if the, the uh, thermal treatment data is uh, impressed right now, will be published. Uh, the first one will be published soon, so um, um, it will all eventually be up on my website. Not again, not to focus too much on the thermal treatment, but I, have you had any conversations with Lynn Williams, the developer, who's pretty pretty um, proactive about his particular device and how he supports it and make sure people make sure that people are using it correctly? Uh -huh. have, you, have you shared I any? Extensive conversation. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, so and, let's and see. with a number of other people who are very much involved with him, and I encourage. But when I put out my article, and analysis were for his benefit, that he um, so to come up with information that I think that he could be able to use to improve the device. That's terrific. Okay, let's see. Uh, Matt Ford is asking. So it seems that you're indicating that the formic and to a lesser extent, oxalic acid did cause measurable quantities of supersedure, but that the negative effect of supersedure and loss of brood production was more than offset by the reduced mite loads over the 42, 63, or 77 day periods. So those of us that often fear the supersedure may be overly sensitive to that concern. Just curious if that's a reasonable interpretation. Okay, I, I don't, even though it looked like maybe there was more supersedure with the oxalic, we, we have not noticed that across the, the board in all the rest of the hives that we, we treated. <clears throat> that was, an ex again, ex an exceptional case there um, um, or, or as far as the queen loss because we were working with high mite hives um, under the worst conditions. So we would have expected that some of them to go queenless or be dead at the end. So I am with the formic, yes, I, I would say yes, very clearly we had increased supersedure. Um, and I, I don't know if I would say supersedure. Supersedure and emergency queen cell rearing are two different things. So the emergency, emergency queen cell mean that the queen is lost and they raise an emergency cell. Supersedure is when they rear a daughter along with while the mother's still there. Yeah. So, um, I guess it depends upon the definition of, of, of supersedure. Uh, so yes, the, clearly the formic did. I'm not sure that the oxalic did. Okay, great. And uh, the manufacturer of formic acid says, hey, if you want to get rid of all your, your failing queens, give them a formic treatment. <laughs> that takes <laughs> care of the failing queens and the bees then have a fresh young queen afterwards. 
<laughs> All right, great. Um, a question about the sponges, oh, uh, sponges as it relates to a top bar hive. So we have a lot of top bar hive uh, beekeepers here in New Mexico. So do you think it would work in a top bar hive and how do you think they would be best applied in a top bar hive? I imagine that they would work just fine uh, hung over the top bars. Yeah, the only issue with a top bar hive is, you know, of course those bars are just butted up right against each other. So they would yep. be- So you, you wanna use a thin matrix. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, question, do you put together these oxalic uh, pads yourself or are they uniformly prepackaged? I want to no, know. No, they're no. They're, 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 they can't, they're not approved yet, so they can't be prepackaged. These are all experimental. We make them ourselves. And you mix up the oxalic acid yourself, right? Yes. Okay. Let's see. Uh, we pretty much have most everything covered <laughs> which is kind of hard to believe. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's see. Sarah Malone asks, she wants to be sure that she understands correctly. Can you use the oxalic acid glycerin strips with honey supers on the hive? Is she asking you whether they're approved by the EPA? No. I guess she's, she's thinking, if all goes well, do you think we'll be able to use them with honey supers on the hive? That is the intent. That is the registration that I'm pushing for. Okay, and um, Frank Gibbons, one of our board members from, he's now in California. Uh, he wonders if the vapor application method of oxalic acid would be more effective if we used it more frequently. Yes, it is. Um, I just published um, a, a paper, oh, no, I'm not, I will be publishing a, a paper soon that shows um, a lady who, um, a person who did a, uh, uh, multiple, multiple vaporizations starting, I think, two weeks apart, and then down to a week apart, and then down to every other day, and showing the mite drops from those that, that, that you have to get um, uh, very short order, uh, uh, just a few days apart, a number of, of vaporizations to get high efficacy if there's brood in the hive. Okay, great. And a question uh, from Tina about how does the OA dribble affect the gut biome of the bees and how does OA extended release affect gut biome? I can't tell you about the dribble, but as far as the extended, I have some colonies in those yards that were in the breeder program. So they did not receive any treatment. So I <clears throat> highlighted them for Vince, who's doing the analysis. And I asked him to, to, to look at those and see if there's a difference from that uh, continual exposure to the oxalic acid. So I hope I will be able to eventually answer that question. That's great. Hey, listen, we're, we're just about done, but I wanted to remind folks that Randy, uh, well, one thing I wanted to suggest was, you know, to the other, all of the speakers today talked about all the work that's ahead of them and all the great ideas they have about research. And many of our, doc, you know, our, our professors, they get to hire postdocs. And so my suggestion for you is that you have more grandchildren. <laughs> Obviously, you're breeding really good technicians. Yes. <laughs> you're working on that. Okay. Well, I guess I also wanted to just remind folks that Randy is not funded by any of these companies, not by Man Lake, not by Dayton, not by, not by Ultra B, not by any of these. And so one of the ways he gets funding to pay to ship these samples across country in dry ice for $5,000 is with small contributions from beekeepers across the country. So I just wanna invite our New Mexico beekeepers who are clearly benefiting from a lot of this information. We're so grateful. If you have the opportunity, go to scientificbeekeeping.com and um, you know, see if we can, in our own way, help out. Thank you for that. I, uh, I, 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 don't, <laughs> I don't make a living on this. I, and uh, um, uh, luckily I'm in the position now uh, retiring that uh, I don't need to make any income, so I can just turn it around, put it all back into research. That's awesome. Well, um, th we wanna thank you once again. Uh, it's been a great day. <laughs> You've been a great contributor. We welcome you to New Mexico. We hope that sometime in, in the future when things return to normal, we can get you on an airplane, you know, and maybe okay. without a mask, you can come <laughs> and shake some hands. But if you were That'd here- That'd be today, wonderful. I'd be shaking your hand. So thank you. All right. Well, great conference, guys. And it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much.